Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so I volunteered to go first because we were coming out of our missions in July. And uh, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians, but uh, anybody? Count Zinzendorf? We got a few. Okay. Um, intensely missionary group of people. So I thought I should just go ahead and go first and segue us right into our Puritans. Um, so Nicholas Ludwig Reichsgraf von Zinzendorf und Pottendorf. That's the only time I'm going to say that tonight. Oh, come on, say it one more time. Uh, I will, I will, I will heretofore be referring to him as just Z. I'm just going to call him Z. No. Uh, no. I don't think so. Um, probably not. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of background on Zinzendorf's family history, uh, where he was coming from. Uh, the Zinzendorf family is one of the oldest noble families in Lower Austria. Many of them were feudal lords, uh, which is, you know, the class system. Uh, they, were, they were just under the, the king and queen. Um, many also occupied important positions in the imperial household. During the early period of the Reformation, the Zinzendorf family became Lutherans. Uh, Zinzendorf's great-grandfather was made an imperial count, and his grandfather, Erasmus, chose to sell his possessions in Austria and moved to Franconia, which is mostly what is modern-day Bavaria in Germany, rather than to accept a forced conversion into Catholicism. Um, Nicholas was the youngest child in his family, and his father passed away when he was only six weeks old. Um, Nicholas was sent to live with his maternal grandmother and an aunt. Um, Zinzendorf's parents had been heavily involved in the Pietist movement, and its founder, Philip Spinner, was actually his godfather. Um, I might spend a little, little while discussing the, a little bit about the Pietist movement. How many of you have heard of the a Pietist movement and know anything about it? Uh, a couple. Pietist. So pietism. Um, anybody want to give us some details on Pietism? You can leave it to me. <laughs> what, what? They tried to live godly, holy lives, emphasize scripture, and certain practices coming out of pure heart, not external conformity. Right. Uh, probably would be looked at, as I was looking back, as maybe being a little legalistic. Like you said, I think it, a lot of it was coming from a pure motives, not a legalistic view. Um, they also, or at least the way it developed, they um, had kind of a little bit of a mystical attitude towards prayer and guidance by what they called inner light. Um, so, you know, intuition, sort of, they believed in revelation, that God would give you revelation personally. And uh, as it developed, even uh, focused so much on personal sanctification that they almost de-emphasized uh, the life of the body. Um, so that's a little bit of where uh, Zinsdorf was coming from. There's a, a little part of an article I read, Sproul, uh, talking about pietism. Um, his article, the article on it is called The One-Two Punch, and he begins talking about the scripture where Christ uh, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, quote, Christ said, seek first that which is first, not first and second, but first, the kingdom of God. That would have made perfect sense had he stopped there, but he didn't. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's two things, or is it? He says, the devil over the past several centuries has been trying to pull us off both sides of the horse. He gave us pietism, which was a one-two punch to the church. Pietism first and most clearly is a view that sees the Christian faith as being merely about our own personal sanctification. It denies implicitly that Jesus has overcome the world, that his reign has implications in every sphere of reality. The second punch is slightly more subtle. 
Pietism casts a shadow on piety. If we buy into pietism, we fail to press the crown rights of Jesus. We fail to seek his kingdom. If we reject pietism, on the other hand, we tend to reject piety as well. Um, so this background in pietism, um, the pietist movement sort of uh, influenced John Wesley a little bit and the holiness movement, if any of you have ever encountered anyone in the holiness movement, they, they tend to be very legalistic and outwardly uh, in their dress and not very loving if you have, you know, facial hair if you're a man or you don't dress like they do. Um, so that's a little bit of the background where, he, where he's coming from. Um, beginning in 1716, Zinzendorf uh, began attending the university at Wittenberg to study law in preparation for a diplomatic career. After his time at Wittenberg and some time spent traveling in France and the Netherlands, he married and decided to settle down. Uh, he bought the Berthelsdorf estate from his grandmother in 1722 and Upper Berthelsdorf from his uncle in 1724. This is a modern map of Germany, but you see this little mouth that comes in. There's sort of a little beak it comes out this way, it's right in the tip of that beak is where the settlement that he bought, this estate, um, which is just that, that in that inset is the Czech, modern day Czech Republic, which is where Moravia and Bohemia would have been. Um, Zinzendorf, along with a few close friends, sought to practically apply their pietist ideals and hoped to promote revival among what they saw as stale Lutheran orthodoxy. Along with preaching and other acts of benevolence, they had a printing house where they printed large quantities of inexpensive Bibles, catechisms, hymnals, and religious tracts, which they distributed to point men to the historical Christ and apostolic church practices. So after he bought this estate, uh, he built his home in the middle section of Berthelsdorf. And in 1722, he decided to receive a small group of Protestant exiles from Moravia, which is in the Czech Republic, onto his property and allowed them to build the village known as Herrenhut on the corner of his estate. They were later joined by a few hundred more oppressed refugees from Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, as the community grew, its reputation for religious freedom began to attract other persecuted believers from various backgrounds. As you can imagine, this brought about some intense conflicts, which finally convinced Zinzendorf to leave his, uh, take an indefinite leave of absence from his court commission in Dresden and move back to his estate to devote himself to full time uh, trying to reconcile these conflicts. So what he did is he began to visit uh, each home in the settlement for prayer and finally called the men of the village together for an intense study of scriptures. The thing they came to focus on uh, in this time of study was how the scriptures described Christian life in community. These studies combined with intense prayer convinced many of the community that they were called to live together in love and that the disunity and conflict they had experienced was contrary to the clear teaching of scripture. Out of this time of prayer and Bible study, Zinzendorf and others in the community drafted what they called the Brotherly Agreement, which set forth some basic expectations and boundaries of this, what was becoming a very communal life. Uh, this agreement, along with a set of rules called the Manorial Injunctions, was signed by the members of the community on May 12th of 1727. And I thought I would just read the, a few points of the brotherly agreement. There were 42 points, and it covers many aspects of, of life in the church and, and you know, what, what a believer is and freedoms and uh, different things. So point number three uh, of the brotherly agreement says, the following are the characteristics of a true member of Christ's body. And these, we, the inhabitants of Herrenhut, 
who simply adhere to the foundation built on the word of God deemed to be the most sure. Whosoever does not confess that he owes his awakening and salvation exclusively to the mercy of God in Christ Jesus, and that he cannot exist without it for one moment of his life, that the greatest perfection in life, were it possible to attain it, without the intercession of the mediator, urged by the plea of his blood and merit, would be of no avail in the sight of God, while it is made acceptable in the beloved. And whoever does not daily prove it by his whole conversation, that it is his full determination to be delivered from sin through the merits of Jesus, and to follow daily more after holiness, to grow in the likeness of his Lord, to be cleansed from all spiritual idolatry, vanity, and self-will, to walk as Jesus did, and to bear his reproach and shame, such an one is not a genuine brother. Points 41 and 42 um, deal with something a little different. 41 says, Everyone shall be at liberty in love to admonish and rebuke his brother, whether there be ground for it or not. But this must be done with great modesty, and all vehemence on either side be carefully avoided. If an explanation or exculpation be offered, the person who gave the admonition ought either to be satisfied with it or refer the case to other brethren. Point 42 says, Should we be called to suffer persecutions, everyone should consider them as precious and most useful exercises. Love those that persecute us, treat them respectfully, answer their questions with modesty and simplicity, and cheerfully submit to what may befall us according to the confession we make before God and man. On August 26th, 1727, 24 men and 24 women of the community covenanted together to alternate in scheduled prayer for one hour each day. It didn't take very long for others to also enlist in this prayer vigil. It continued to grow. Uh, even the children of the community started a similar practice among themselves. So in Leviticus 6.13, speaking of the altar in the tabernacle, God commands, Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. And this became the Moravian view of prayer. Uh, this prayer vigil, 24-7, was kept up for over 100 years. Um, one thing of note to keep in mind also is the average age of those in this movement was 30 years old. Zinzendorf himself was only 27. So it was a very young movement. Um, the prayer vigil certainly helped to strengthen the sense of unity at Herrenhut. Perhaps the most powerful thing to come from the vigil was an ever-growing hunger for evangelism. Six months after the prayer vigil began, 26 Moravians stepped forward to volunteer for missionary work wherever the Lord may lead. Two of the requirements that they had to be considered for missionary work were you must be married and you must be willing to die for the cause. And they would actually interview husbands and wives separately and ask them a series of questions. And if they didn't answer those questions with the answers that they were looking for, then they, didn't, they were not even considered for missionary service. Um, because of this um, requirement to be married uh, and the zeal for missions, the community soon had what became known as militant marriages, where young men and young women would come together in marriage simply to meet the requirement to be considered for missionary work, which in our Western mindset may not sound very romantic, but, you know, coming together to give your life to service to the Lord, that's, that's pretty romantic, you know. <laughs> I think so. Um, when it came to ch uh, making the choice, once the candidates went through the questioning, uh, and their consideration, um, names were chosen by lot to keep the decision totally up to God. Um, the first two missionaries that were sent out from Herrenhut were David Nitschman and John Dober. They were sent to the island of St. Thomas in the Caribbean. Uh, after arriving on the island, they actually attempted to sell themselves into slavery. 
in order to get closer to the slaves and be able to minister to them while they're working, you know. And you hear this story, if you, if you hear about the Moravians, you always hear about them selling themselves into slavery. They weren't actually allowed to do it. Um, but they did try to sell themselves into slavery just to be able to reach the slaves. Um, after a short while, uh, David Nitschman on the left there returned to the community at Herrenhut, and in 1735 in Berlin, he was consecrated as the first bishop of the Moravian Brethren. Now, this Moravian movement was kind of a revival of what's known as the Unitus Fratum that actually traces its roots back to John Huss. So, way back. Um, uh, this was a lot of the ideals that they were trying to promote um, were um, actually the Moravians brought that's that, because that was their heritage. They brought into the, um, into the, the community at Herrenhut. So as they began to send all these missionaries out, um, all of them kept journals and they made two copies, one for themselves and one to send back to the community in Germany. And later they would keep a third copy to send to the colonies. Um, these journals were read during the nightly prayer meetings at Herrenhut. The reports of the missionaries themselves caused the community to want to live even more sacrificially. Now, they had already um, began living very sacrificially and communally um, already, um, but they soon began to put even more emphasis on further developing their system of communal living and organizing communal families based on age, marital status, and gender, and also really co-opt um, sharing workspace for different industry, um, all for the purpose of being able to more efficiently, be more efficient monetarily so that they could send more missionaries out and better support the ones they already had in the field. Um, didn't take very long, they began exploring even more ways to promote missions, uh, even buying their own ships. And by 1735, a group of Moravians had founded a missionary community in Georgia. There's a certain Anglican minister here who encountered the Moravians on a ship while en route to Georgia. And while there, he had the, uh, they had a lasting and profound effect on his life. I'm not going to spend much time talking about this guy, but uh, there should be at least one guy in this room that knows who this is. Uh, anybody? Anybody? We're looking at John Wesley. Uh, so if you want to hear more about him, I'm going to leave that up to Eric in a couple of weeks. He'll be covering John and Charles Wesley. Um, I do have a video clip that tells us a little bit about how they handled themselves on these journeys from Europe over to the colonies. Um, it's a couple of minutes. Here's the letter. On board ship, daily texts were read and meditated upon at their morning and evening devotion. The night watch and hourly intercession was observed. One whole day was set aside as a day of prayer and thanksgiving. Love feasts were frequently observed. Regular times were set apart in these floating congregations for worship, and regularity and promptness were meticulously observed. At six o'clock in the morning came the call to arise, wash, and dress. At seven was the morning blessing. At eight, breakfast. For nine to twelve, the English brethren studied the German language, and the Germans the English. At twelve, the noon meal. The afternoon was spent in some useful occupation, such as spinning, sewing, mess duties, and making hammocks. At six, the evening meal. At seven, song services, one in German and others in English. At nine, a conference of the officers, class leaders, and supervisors. And at 10, the night prayer watch began, continuing until 6 a.m. These night watchmen, working in pairs and hourly shifts, spent their time in prayer and vigil. The letter continues. The system covering the minutest details was carried out to provide cleanliness, proper decorum, and discipline. Before the sailing of the second sea congregation, Spangenberg, who was in Europe at the time, divided it into six groups, three of men and three of women. 
The women, both married and unmarried, lived on one side of the ship and all the men on the other. Each person was assigned definite duties. One struck the hour on a bell. Some were teachers, others exhorters. A health committee was appointed, consisting of a doctor and assistants. Some were chosen as nurses. Other committees were the cooks and his assistants, the steward and his assistants, those who had to wait on the tables, and finally the ship crew, all Moravians working under Captain Gar Garrison. Can I chop that off? Also, feel free to stop me if you have any questions or you want me to speak a little more about anything that I've mentioned. Um, so not long after establishing this Georgia settlement, the Spanish began making war against the British. And because of the Moravians' peaceful resistance stance to love their neighbors as themselves, they decided to relocate to Pennsylvania some of the brethren had already been in Nazareth helping George Whitfield build a school for African-American children, but they soon got into a disagreement with Whitfield over predestination and were let go by him because of their belief in free will. Uh, as God's providence would have it, they used their free will to found a small missionary community. Uh, and on Christmas Eve, 1741, Zinzendorf, Nichman and a small group of Moravians founded Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Just one year earlier, Zinzendorf had been forced off of his land in Saxony and used the opportunity to form what he called Pilger Germina, or Pilgrim Communities, a traveling mission group saying that it should be, quote, a school of the prophets that moves like a blessed cloud as the wind of the Lord pushes it and makes everything fruitful. And it happened to be that they ended up in this, the colonies and founded Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, they were very non-sectarian, probably to the point of being a little too ecumenical sometimes. Um, they did, uh, like as of the beginning, they had many, because of the freedoms that they had, they allowed all denominations to come in and sometimes were maybe a little, a little too lax in... Uh, in their sticking to the truth. Um, a year after founding Bethlehem, Zinzendorf said that those arriving from Europe must be examined and tested to maintain the purity of the settlement. He said, quote, it is to be feared that our church may sicken due to its largeness rather than its smallness, which is a, a view that we share <laughs> uh, very much. Uh, they did not neglect local evangelism either. Um, they were, so they weren't just sending missionaries out to other, other places. Uh, they had different categories of evangelists. Uh, fishers, which ministered locally to the natives and other European settlers. Um, rural, which were farther reaching, semi-full-time. Um, most of the time they stayed away traveling around the area. Uh, and messengers, which were sent to the ends of the earth. Um, as people were born again, these communities practiced a radical equality of spiritual life. In Bethlehem, nobility and converted Native Americans shared common quarters. And in Salem, uh, slaves were full members of the church and could be elected to offices of leadership, which was a radical thing for, for that time period. Um, as the outreach continued, they copied the colony pattern that, that they had formed in Bethlehem and small Moravian communities began to pop up all around the world. One of the strong points of this kind of life is that as they reached people with the gospel, they also educated and discipled them. Uh, as these settlements were established and grounded in the faith, they sent out more missionaries to establish other mission communities. So the cycle of disciples making disciples just continued. Um, the Moravians really got this. Um, more so than maybe any other group since. They understood the Great Commission. Um, let's read it all together. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Father, 
and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Now, the Industrial Revolution did a lot to change society as a whole. And many of the Moravian ways became less practical, um, not as easy to keep up. And some of them were eventually left behind. The prayer vigil also eventually came to an end. Um, Wasn't really able to find out much information on exactly why or when it came to an end. Um, There is still a Moravian church as far as a denomination. Uh, They're still governed by a modified version of the brotherly agreement that has evolved over the years. According to their website, the Moravian church is a worldwide church of only slightly more than 900,000 people. The Moravian church is a church where people matter and where love and compassion flow freely from God through people. The Moravian church is a warm, friendly, accepting atmosphere in which to grow in your relationships with God and people. The Moravian church is a down-to-earth approach to faith and life that seeks to emphasize Christian faith, hope, and love, and de-emphasizes doctrines and creeds. So you see some of the evolution of the movement, some of that uh, maybe over-ecumenicalism has crept back in. Um, But the lasting effect, as far as missions goes, uh, is probably incalculable. Um, Just the sheer amount of missionaries they sent out and the effect it had in uh, forming all these communities in regions all all over the world. Um, really was the birth of what we would consider modern missions. Um, So that's really all I have. Does anybody have any questions, comments, critiques? Don't, flattery will get you nowhere. (laughs) Okay, I think next week, um, Justin is up with Whitfield. So... Keep him in your prayers. I think he's still recovering from some kind of sickness. Um, So pray for him. Um, Daryl, if you would, would you close us in prayer, please?